way we move in it, and so therefore the way the world is. It's an ontological, ethical, and epistemological issue. Yeah, we have already been answering some of these questions, let's move on. Uh, of course, the issue of the plurality of bodies that actually is out there, and which are not able to match the given functional requirements of a system is very important in a project like this. This can apply to work technologies, it can apply to anything. Um, there will be significant work in this project with um, people with disabilities also. But uh, mm, I think we can approach that in a very broad sense, insofar as each of us could be considered disabled, insofar as nobody, I think, totally fits and matches perfectly into a given paradigm. There's always, each body has always got divergences and particularities. And that, again, needs to be more subtly investigated. So who is doing this? Well, there's plenty of people involved. I will try to run through now the more technical issues. Um, we have here the 11 co-organizers, co uh, amongst which is Novalia, uh, Reverso, which is me, is uh, coordinating the thing. And we have uh, another 18 or 19 associate partners with people like IRCAM, Duke University, Berkeley, and so on. Um, so many of them are doing more academic theoretical work or philosophical work, or scientific de developments, techno-scientific, neurosciences, alternative mathematics. Um, all the arts disciplines are involved. Uh, so it's really very, very transdisciplinary. And of course, one of the crucial um, issues there will be how to translate to one another, because each of us will be having a different embodied knowledge, a different way of relating to, to the concepts and the work. We have a fabulous a fabulous advisory board with some of the world pioneers of all the critical issues that I'm presenting to you, Donna Haraway, Catherine Hales, and so on, are people who have been for decades now advancing uh, some of these crucial critical questions that I'm trying to, to question you. So I'm really proud of having in the advisory board people who have been inspiring my own work for, for a long time. <coughs> Stellar also, Brian Asumi. And he, so fabulous performers also are part of the of this multidisciplinary advisory board. Now um, I will present you now the, the eleven co-organizers very quickly that you see that they are very they have different r ranges, uh, but uh, there's a lot of bodily performance-based work in it. Reverso will have been years developing project for alternate forms of perception, if you want. They look like performances, but actually they are something different. I think. I call it metaformance, which is a transformation of per perception. Infamous from Geneva, they are more scientific oriented. They have developed this software, Iceweb. Um, and they have great experience in this kind of, of projects. Uh, while they, they, they attempt <coughs> to uh, analyze uh, expressive gesture and emotion in a more subtle way than, than is usual. Transmedia Academy from Dresden, they, they are a media arts organization. They developed this, this uh, Synet Art Festival in Hellerau, this, this huge theater in, in Dresden, every year. And they do lots of work with, with performance and dance. Um, Design and Performance Lab in Brunel University, London, with Johannes Birlinger. Kadans, a uh, dance uh, company based in Toulouse, working a lot with, with uh, interactive dance and technologies, digital technologies, video, and so on. Stein is a unique institution in, in Amsterdam. It's the only studio in the world that is devoted to creating new kinds of musical electroacoustic instruments for real time. Fabrica de Movimentos in Portugal, they organize lots of events on dance and new technologies. Uh, Palindrome in Weimar is another company that's been working for many years in dance and technology, and now they are more focused on a project called Motion Composer, which is instruments for people with disabilities. So music instruments for people with disabilities. That will be uh, part of the project as well. From the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, uh, my colleague Eva Botella, who is working on history of emotions. This will bring in a more kind of 
academic approach from a historical perspective, <coughs> the contingency of emotion, of, the, of our understanding of emotions, and of course how this can be brought into uh, the current way in which emotions are produced and reproduced in a given technological context. Co-authors with uh, Pablo Palacio Muriel Romero, they have also been years working on, on very interesting interactive dance projects. In Novalia, you know very well, I don't have to introduce, we are now their guests here. They also do, because you don't know, immense uh, developments in, in a huge variety of fields from a techno-scientific perspective. Um, and one of the associate partners is going to have a very significant role Hyperbody Research Group from Delft University, they are an architecture group, and they will be very involved, especially in the fourth and fifth year, because this project that, as I say, has got this more uh, research-oriented aspect of understanding what's going on nowadays in, in terms of homogenization and so on, but also of producing other paradigms. Well, of course, this will have a very bodily kind of research uh, attached to it. It's not just you know, if we really want to question our interfaces, our softwares, our more f most fundamental technological paradigms, we have to redefine it in a way, not from scratch, but really go to the depths of it. So we can't just keep designing in the traditional way. So this means that we will <coughs> produce laboratories for perception, for motion, for interaction, and all kinds. All of these will coalesce in the fourth year into a, an architectural structure that will contain these laboratories. So all these modules that you were seeing before will eventually become a mobile architectural structure. Uh, so you see the work progression. The third year, we start building like a physical laboratories, but still modular, smaller. In the fourth year, apart from build, building the network, we, we develop this architectural module that will be transforming itself in its physical structure, not only in whatever is going on inside it um, with the relation that the body is established in terms of, of uh, movement relations. That can, that can be done not only through digital haptic means, but we hope to invent new kinds of ways of generating modulating spaces that react effectively to movement. And in the fifth year, this, this uh, laboratory will be touring throughout the nine European cities involved in the project. So throughout nine months, you will have this strange spaceship installed in squares or wherever of these cities, and people will be going in there, like an installation. There will be performances, workshops, artist residencies, and so on and so forth. So the project has this double, also this double element of having a very long-term kind of research approach, but also a very direct kind of impact, in a way, uh, in, the, in the respective communities, hopefully. Um, well, so the outcomes are really primarily a new kind of methodology and network, transdisciplinary network. The tools for understanding all these challenging issues I, I presented to you. Uh, and for generating these new kinds of environments, these kind, new kinds of embodied networks. Bodynet is part of the... Of the Bodynet is, uh, is, should, be, should become a network of bodies. So a net, internet is always a network of bodies, but we turn to forget about that. So we want to really develop a very aware or self-aware network of, aware of its embodied nature, its embodied character. This will be one of the, of the issues to develop well, the project along with the workshops that we will be doing every four months in one of the cities and the public presentations, conferences, publications, and so on and so forth. So we will still, of course, use some of the old media. Um, so I think we're done. And uh, so I hope that we can have a, a deep discussion if we have time. I'm sorry, I think I have gone over time probably. So thank you.
Thank you very much, Jaime. We did uh, run over uh, lunchtime a little bit, so um, I would uh, ask you guys to have a quick question and to continue the discussion on the lunch uh, space over there, if you wish. So if there is any quick question before we uh, go to lunch. Um, is, there, is, there any, is there any purpose uh, to this all, all this question, like uh, reflection, uh, bring answer to question, but this question, reflection brings answer to question, and uh, is is it for change our life or is it just for asking questions? My my answer is a bit well, large, but of course it is addressing mm, things that uh, I find extremely problematic that I find are like, crucial. So that the things that I've been questioning here are the elements that I find are the most crucial problems inherent to our current controlled society. So this project attempts to address <coughs> the most perverse, hidden, concealed ways of functioning of a controlled society, of course, in order to, to, well, yeah, to propose a variety of potential alternatives which would have to go very deep then into the way all these technologies are structured in terms of modulating our affects, our desires, assimilating and capturing us as bodies into this machine and so on. Just taking into account that some people propose something that I find quite plausible and interesting that just like one billion years ago, unicellular, unicellular organisms that were stemming from bacteria started to coalesce into multicellular organisms eventually leading to things like us. Some people say that we are now in a similar process of coalescing into a super cyber organism, a super cyborg. But um, the big difference, the crucial difference, is that whereas bacteria were generating the Earth's ecosystems in a radically horizontal kind of relationality amongst themselves. They generated literally the ecosystems of the Earth. We are destroying them. Well, just maybe to put the very pragmatic uh, um, answer to, let's say, this questioning and embodiment and proprioception. For instance, uh, not necessarily to use the word control, but let's say, obsolescence or something, like everything you use, the technology we use on the computer, like your, your iPhone and all these things are things that are not invented for you as a user, it's invented by a computer science lab somewhere that think it's a good solution without any broader perspective. Uh, the, the window and clicking system is made uh, more than 40 years ago and it's totally inadequate because we don't work this way. So like the proprioception is, is wrong to start with. And even like the mobile phones, for instance, um, for your body, the gesture is wrong. Actually, the first version of the of iPhones and stuff, you were touching from the back, which works much better, but you couldn't do it. I mean, it and, and so forth. So a, a lot of time is uh, uh, the paradigm is like you know you gotta hammer, you gotta hammer to find a nail. That's the way technology works. It's not driven by our body needs. It's driven by the solution we can have. I mean, it's still okay, but it's. Um, I'm just surprised that we're using very obsolete things at this stage, and we think it's high tech. I mean, it's, and it's totally dissociated with what we need to do. Uh, like most of the gadgets you were seeing, is like uh, I have one of these things to monitor my rowing, and usually I leave it on the counter and I spend 500 calories um, because all these things are wrongly calibrated and they, they don't work. And, so we start believing that these things are actually doing something, which in reality, not so much. I mean, they work better when they're off, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, in a more pragmatic answer, um, this can help to understand infinite potential things. Like, for example, what's wrong about the current information technologies, the way they are reducing our affective spectrum, our nonverbal spectrum, and so on? That would be of interest, potentially, to even the large corporations that are developing them, but hopefully not to develop more subtle control technologies. That is a danger, of course. That's always a danger. This would become, if Apple takes it, maybe, or whatever, uh, uh, an optimization of control if they are used in a certain way. That's, of course, not what we want. 
um, but uh, it can open up uh, fields in any, in any, I mean, we consider that this could redefine aspects that are now being very reductively approaching robotics, as you would say, like trying to imitate always like the SEMO and so on, in, in virtual reality, in, in anything almost, or in technologies of work, for example, what are the problems that people working in a workplace are facing because of their alignments of movement uh, at every level, not just, you know, digital media. We are going to look into everything, architecture, every perceptual technology. It seems like uh, coming back to the body, the way you're describing, is perhaps a double-edged sword. So, yeah. so one hand, it, it yeah. represents knowledge that you, in, in ways of being that can't be quantified can't be so readily controlled. What do you say that represents? What represents? The, the, uh, to deal with the body. Ah, the body, the body. Yes, yeah, so we move yeah. away from the easily quantifiable. Yeah. So that's a plus. But at the same time, it suggests some normativity. There's still biological ways that we process, limits to what we can process, how the brain works to bring our sense, senses together. Mm. Okay. So if we start talking about work that is, uh, as you say, has uh, no object that's exploring new affects, that is radically contingent, that is radically unpredictable, do we risk moving into something that for the body is actually um, incoherent or perhaps even psychotic? I don't think so for a very simple reason. I think, uh, well, of course, that will have to be seen. I think I understood your question. And, um, so, Sorry, the first part was saying that the way the body. Um, the Maybe if, if we were uh, part of the human organism, I think yeah. looks for order, looks for structure and understanding, okay. building meaning around it. So but if we dissolve so, that yeah. too much, do we cause a problem? Yeah. Uh, so I think that this is what you are talking about is a representation of the human organism. The organism itself is a representation. Okay. So that's the crucial difference we need to make. This is an ontological difference. So we tend, because of our culture, because of our epistemic culture, we tend to confuse the map with the territory. So the body is not only an organism. This is what Deleuze and Guattari say. It's much more to the body than the organism. The organism is just one way of understanding certain ways of operating of a body in a given milieu. But there are, of course, many things in our daily lives, like, you know, ecstatic experiences in love or in creation processes or in mystical experience or whatever, or, you know, uh, in any circumstance that are exceeding whatever we think that a body can do, which is, of course, this famous Spinozian sentence. We don't know what a body can do because he was thinking the body in terms of affects, of potential capacities, not of given, predefined, quantifiable capacities. So I think that uh, only if we think of the world as quantifiable, it can have limits. The, quali the qualitative has no limits because there's no quantification to it. You see the difference? If we start understanding our difference in qualitative terms and not quantitative terms, there are no limits to that. It's a different kind of immanence that we generate. We generate an immanent relation. We are not <coughs> seeing from an outset something that can be cartographed. We are entering, of course, deep philosophical questions. So. But so I don't know if I have in any way answered. Uh, but of course, I understand your point, and you know, we will have to be careful. Maybe I will end psychotic after the third year. You know, it's a possibility. Maybe I am already. But um, um, I think that it is actually, you know, schizophrenia has emerged with capitalism. So certain kinds of alignment of bodies produce, of course, also a particular kind of. I am interested maybe in how this could eventually, eventually become even a therapeutic kind of <coughs> paradigm that helps to solve some of the problems raised by a, a system of super alignment of bodies, whereby things are a priori not super aligned if you look around. I believe that we are a great anomaly. Maybe we have to rethink if we are a failed evolution. And we have to learn to dance complexity uh, in a way we, we, we have forgotten to. 
thank you so much. We really can go on over there. Uh, I appreciate very much your presentation, your questions, and I hope we can keep it up for the afternoon lectures. So thank you and you're welcome.